morning, everybody, and welcome to worship this morning. Can you all hear me all right? Okay. Just a few uh, announcements. Um, last week, the voting was held for Nathan and Johnny uh, as elders, um, and you all vote in favour of that, and we plan to have their installation next Sunday morning. Um, unless there are any objections. Um, Prime time is, is in the bulletin meeting this Tuesday. Um, they're not meeting, rather they're meeting on Wednesday at a tavern. Most of you know where that is, I believe. <laughs> um, this coming Saturday evening, we're having a farewell dinner for the Nutrans, and you all would have received an invitation, a uh, bit of a program. And uh, we welcome you to uh, participate um, with some skits or a poem or a musical item or some entertainment that you would like. Please, um, please consider that and then uh, either respond to Alex or to myself and um, we'll see what we can put in for the evening and we'll have a nice, a lovely evening together. Um, thank you. Have a blessed service. Good morning, congregation. The idea that there might be skits is a little bit scary. Um, that implies that there are, I don't know, characteristics of me that could get exaggerated and <laughs> mercilessly mocked or roasted. I, I'm not sure exactly what Ed had in mind. It sounds like Ed has, Ed has some plans. Um, so I'm a little bit, little bit nervous about that. Um, maybe I'll do something similar in, uh, myself and uh, get my own back. It's good that we can gather to worship God together this morning. And we hear in the psalm, Psalm 130, these words, Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness so that we can with reverence serve you. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than the watchmen wait for the morning, more than the watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. We remember as Christmas draws near in this season of Advent that indeed the Lord himself did redeem Israel from all her sins. The Lord came to his people. He came to people unworthy, people who, if the Lord was keeping a record of sins, we could never erase that record ourselves. But what we could not do, Christ did. And that draws us to worship. That draws us into his presence with reverence this morning. With, with reverence and with joy. Let's pause in a moment of silent and personal prayer as we prepare our hearts for worship. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that you have called us into your presence. And we wait for you. We wait for you as the watchman waited. We wait for the coming of the Lord Jesus, coming again. And as we gather together this morning in your name, acknowledging that you are our help and our strength, our confidence, our every hope. Father, would you fill us with fresh hope, we pray. And we, may we know your grace, mercy and peace in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. We read from one of the Psalms. We're going to sing one of the Psalms. We're going to close with a Psalm as well later on in our service. We're going to open with Psalm 96. Please stand and sing.
to invite the children to come and join me up at the front. We've got a lot of children away today because school holidays have begun for lots of people, not everyone. So at least our primary school is in younger. It would be great if you'd come up and join me and you can help me. And we're going to talk about a few things together. So we've got Anne Jackson's coming too. <coughs> Beautiful. <coughs> I've got a question for you. Can you imagine to today, can you imagine that someone has invited you to their birthday party? Is that an exciting thing? Have you ever been invited maybe to a birthday party though and found that maybe you haven't always gotten on very well with the person who's invited you? Do you ever have friends that you sometimes get a bit grumpy with your friends? Yeah? Yeah, I think that happens. That's a normal thing. And it's not just for children. Adults have that happen sometimes too. And would it be fun going to, your birth to, going to that birthday party if you were still a little bit grumpy with the person whose birthday it was? Can you imagine you'd get there and you'd be like, here's your present. <laughs> I have to give it to you, my mum said. Here's the present. I'm really grumpy that I'm at your party, other than that there's good food. I'll just eat the food and not have very much fun. Would, that, would you enjoy a party like that? I don't think you would enjoy a party like that. You'd be the whole time feeling a little bit sad inside because it would be like you're not friends together. And it would be such a better birthday party and you would actually enjoy yourself and have a lot of fun if you were friends together. It'd be a bit like that maybe within your family if you're a bit grumpy with a brother or a sister and you sit down to have a special family meal together. Would that be a lot of fun? Not if you're grumpy with everyone. If you're grumpy with everyone and people have maybe somebody called somebody uh, an, a mean or nasty name or somebody used their foot to um, tap somebody else in a way that they probably shouldn't have done or something like that, then that wouldn't be a fun, fun family meal, would it? Same with the birthday party. Next Sunday, the grown-up people and the adults here in our church are going to have a special meal together. Does anyone know what that meal is called? It's in church. And it's a meal where you have just a little piece of something to eat and a little piece of something to drink. I wonder what that could be. Hmm. Guess what? Bread and wine. Bread and wine. Yeah. And what do we call the bread and the wine? Joel? The Passover. That's right. That's when they first had it. And then when Jesus and his disciples had the Passover meal, they, we, we call it something else as well. Can you remember another word that we might use for that? There's lots of different words. Okay, Kester. The bread does represent Jesus' body and the wine, Jesus' blood. We call that the Lord's Supper or communion or the Eucharist, depending on the different church that you're in. That's what the grown-up and adult people in our church are going to have be celebrating next week. Do you think it would be good to, for them to come to a special meal that Jesus has prepared if they were grumpy with Jesus? No, oh, that would be a bad thing, wouldn't it? What about if they were grumpy with other people in the church? Would that be a good thing or a bad thing? That would be a bad thing as well. And God in the Bible tells us that we need to examine ourselves to make sure that we're coming to the special meal with the right attitude. And so for the mums and dads and other adults, what that means is they need to make sure that they love God and walking with God, and that they uh, fix any problems they have with other people. So maybe we could pray for them. Do you think we could pray for the mums and dads and the other adults people? Let's, let's come to God and we'll pray for them this morning. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we want to pray for the mums and the dads in our church and the other adults, and we want to pray for them today. And often we know they pray for us, but we want to pray for them today. And we want to pray that you'll help them to prepare for the Lord's Supper this coming Sunday. We thank you and pray that you'll help them to be walking in a good relationship with you. And we pray that you'll help them to be at peace with one another in the church so that they can come together and celebrate this meal with Jesus. And it might be a good time and not a little bit grumpy and sad like it might be if we were at a birthday party with someone who we didn't really get on very well with right then. 
We pray that you'll help them to do that very well uh, this coming week, that they can celebrate and join with joy on Sunday. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Does Jesus forgive our <coughs> sins when we ask him? He does. And so we can have every confidence that when we come to God and ask him to forgive us our sins, and when our mums and dads do the same, then they know that they're going to be forgiven as well. Because that's why Jesus came into the world. For God so loved the world that he gave, what did he give? He gave Felix his only son that whoever does something, what do they do? What do they do, Joel? Believes in me shall not perish, but will have eternal life. Believes in me shall not perish, but have eternal life. And a little bit later in our service, we're going to see Kenrick's going to show that he believes in Jesus. He's going to come up to the front and talk a little bit about that. We call that a profession of faith. So keep watching and you'll see what that's all about as well. Okay, you can head back to back to your seats where you are. We'll keep praying for our mums and dads this week. Right now we're going to sing. We're going to sing two songs. The first song, Oh Great God of Highest Heaven, a prayer for all of us that we that our hearts might be filled with the love of God and the fellowship of God. And we're going to sing of how the Lord is our salvation. Let's stand to sing.
congregation. Today we are privileged to present to you uh, Kenrick, who wishes to profess his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour, and to become uh, a communicant member, sharing in all the rights and responsibilities that belong to full and active membership in the Church of Christ. When he was baptised, God made clear his claim on him as his own, and he was received into the church. Through God's word and the spirit, he has come to faith in Christ and understanding of his place in God's covenant of grace. Now he wishes to share fully in the life of this congregation and the whole worldwide church of God. So today he will publicly accept and confirm what was sealed in his baptism, profess his faith in the Lord Jesus, and offer himself to God as his willing servant. We thank God for giving Kenrick this desire and pray that as we now witness his profession, God will favour us with the presence and guidance of his Holy Spirit. Kenrick, I'd like to invite you to come up to the front. Kenrick, when you uh, came here quite a number of years ago, you were a lot littler. And your hair was a lot shorter. <laughs> We're glad that you can be with us today. And perhaps you can tell us what God has done in your life and what's brought you to this point that you've expressed a desire to make a profession of faith today. Um, yeah, well, uh, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, you know, I've always been uh, as, you know, um, with a family, uh, yeah, church Christian family and so God then to his Bible and his teaching has always been in the family but kind of I'd always hadn't really thought about it very much and um, you know several years ago I thought oh, well it was it kind of became to the came to the point where I was like yeah no this is actually what I believe this is what I want to do and this is this is how I want to live my life from now on uh, you know just a gradual process kind of thing but eventually got to a point where I was like yeah and um and then kind of, you know, after thinking that, I was like, you know, I can't, thinking in my head, like, yeah, profession of faith, I mean, I saw Arwen and Corin, my, um, you know, do it before me. I was like, yeah, you know, I, I think I would like to do that. So, yeah, now, I, now I'm going to profess my faith, yeah. That's great. We're thankful to God for the work that he's done in your heart and life to bring you to this point. And so, in the presence now of God and his people, we invite you to profess your faith in him and make your vows. Thanks, Devlin. Um, I profess that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Saviour, and I want to follow and serve him as his disciple. I believe that he is the Son of God sent to redeem the world. I love and trust him as the one who saves me from my sin. I continue to turn from my rebellion against the Lord and embrace him as Lord of my life with repentance and joy. I acknowledge the teaching of the Old and New Testament summarised in the Apostles' Creed and our confessions and taught in this Christian church as the true and complete doctrine of salvation. I accept the gracious promises of God sealed in my baptism and affirm my union with Christ and his church, which baptism signifies. I promise to do all I can with the help of the Holy Spirit to strengthen my love and commitment to Christ by sharing faithfully in the life of the church and its means of grace, honouring and submitting to its supervision and discipline. And I join with the people of God in doing the work of the Lord wherever I am. Kenrick, I have these words for you from 1 Timothy Chapter 6, Paul has been writing to Timothy, uh, a young pastor, and he's just been speaking about the temptation of seeking money and wandering from the faith. And he says, But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight to the good fight of the faith. And take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And may God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honour and might forever. Amen. Now, Kenrick, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, 
after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Now let's come before the Lord in prayer. Let's pray together. Lord our God, we thank you for your word and spirit through which we know Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. And it's our prayer this morning that Kenrick may never cease to wonder at all that you have done for him. Would you help him to continue firmly in the faith, to bear witness to your love and let the Holy Spirit shape his life. Take him, good shepherd, into your care so that he may loyally endure opposition in serving you. And may we, with all your children, live together in the joy and power of your Holy Spirit. We ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the hope of his coming. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. of exercising your gifts, the fellowship of his joys and sufferings. And as congregation we respond. Thanks be to God. We rejoice in your profession and promise you our love, encouragement and prayers. We have a certificate to commemorate this day and we also got a gift that we'll give you on behalf of the congregation. Um, this is a study Bible that, that you've chosen, so it's not a surprise gift. That's why I didn't wrap it up. It would have just been a waste of, waste of paper. Um, a study Bible, The Bible Speaks Today, which is uh, a really good commentary series run, running through the whole of the Bible. And the study notes uh, in this particular study Bible are from that commentary series as it works through the whole of the Bible. And we pray, Kenrick, that God's word would continue to shape your life and guide you. Um, that God's word would continue to speak to you, not just today, but every day of your life. And that God will give you strength to continue in your profession. So thank you. Congregation, we'd like to invite you to make a profession of faith as well together this, this morning. So can I invite you to stand and we're going to confess our faith together with the words of the Apostles' Creed. We join together, not just with Kenrick, but with the church of all ages, and down through the ages, and confess our faith together using these words. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing together. We're going to sing together a song that Kenrick's chosen as we remain standing. How deep the Father's love. Please remain standing and we'll sing.
heading out to Sunday School for their last Sunday School of 2021. You can make your way out with your teachers now they're ready for you. Let's come to God in prayer. Let's pray. Now, Father, even as many of the younger children in our congregation have just gone out to their Sunday school class this morning, we want to pray for them. We want to pray for our children and for their teachers and we especially want to pray for our children that you would help their faith to grow that they might see the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ and profess faith in him as his disciples we pray that you would help us as parents to help nurture and encourage their faith as as they continue to grow. We want to pray for their teachers today. We're thankful for their willingness to serve our covenant family in this way. And we pray your blessing upon them this morning and also next year. Father, we're thankful as a church for the election last Sunday of John and Nathan to serve in the office of elder. We pray that you will equip them with everything that they need to do your will and to serve uh, faithfully and uh, admirably in the office to which you've called them. We want to pray for session then also as they meet for the final time uh, this year on Tuesday. We pray that you would give our elders wisdom and guidance as they plan for the remainder of this year and start looking ahead into next year. Father, we pray for Rhea this morning and for Bill and for Anne and Yvonne, all of whom are unable to be with us at this time for worship. We want to pray for them at home as they watch our services a little later on, either today or tomorrow. We ask for your blessing and strength upon them and their situation and their time of need. We pray and continue to pray for Emmy in Sydney and pray that you would give her, uh, give her strength in this uh, extended period of uh, absence from uh, her family and from her church family. Give her strength for this time and bring her back to us uh, safely soon, we pray. We want to pray as well that as we enter into what is often a very busy time of year, that you would help us to slow down that you would help us to prepare our hearts for a time of remembering the coming of Jesus. And not just to remember his first coming, but to prepare our hearts for his second coming as well. May this be a season of the year in which we are filled with a fresh sense of wonder and awe, of thankfulness and gladness, for all that you have done for us in sending Jesus to be our Saviour. And Father, as we open your word together this morning, may we see Jesus. May we see Jesus through, through our reflection on the lives of those who have gone well before us in the faith. Help us to see Christ and help our hearts to be encouraged. Fill us with hope, we pray. And may your spirit guide us as we open your word together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's turn in God's word, firstly to our New Testament reading, which comes from the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11. We read from verse 8 about the faith of Abraham. And Sarah, I should say. The reason I say and Sarah is verse 11 is one of the occasions where the new version of the NIV that we have here is infinitely preferable to the old one. And, and, and 
in the older NIV that we used to have in our pew, when it comes to the faith of Sarah, even though the Greek text says, and by faith even Sarah, it used to say, and by faith even Abraham, rather than Sarah. It was interpreting the faith of Sarah, which is commended to us as something that was of Abraham. And I think this is, this is much more faithful to the text of Scripture. Hebrews 11 from verse 8, By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared a city for them. Now we turn in the book of Genesis to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11 and we begin reading at verse 27 and read into chapter 12 and verse 9. This is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the father of Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth. Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was childless because she was not able to conceive. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram. And together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moreh at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on towards the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. This is the word of God. A 
long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. That's how each of the Star Wars films begins. And it's somewhat like that for us this morning. We're back in Genesis a long time ago in a world far, far away. Far away from us in time, far away from us in geography, far away from us in history, far away from us culturally, far away from us in familiarity. And I was going to riff off the Star Wars theme and call this message the return of the kingdom because we've been reflecting on the kingdom for a long time now. I actually did call it that in the order of service our musicians received. God had his kingdom, the the empire of of Babel uh, struck back and and now return of the kingdom. And and that's that's about right. That's about right in the storyline of these early chapters of the Bible. But then I remember the the uh, retitled original film, uh, simply Star Wars, when it came out and thought, ah, yes, this is the return of the kingdom, but a new hope is better still. For that's what we have this morning here in, in, in our text, in our preaching text, a new hope. The flood reset the kingdom. The kingdom is back, on, uh, back, in, back in action. But it didn't take long for Babel Tower to see the nations scattered throughout the world. Hardly one nation under God. Rather many peoples with nothing to do with God. And we might wonder, did we not know more, if that was all there was ever to be. You see, every time the kingdom has begun to take hold, it seems, on planet Earth, it's come to nothing. Is there hope for something better this time, rather than than simply an endless wheel of time where history repeats? Can the kingdom of God get off the ground? Can it take root? Can it flourish in this world? These are the questions we're answering this morning, and our text today gives us a new hope. And it begins with a new family. Chapter 11, verse 27, begins a new section of the book of Genesis. One of the longest sections of the book of Genesis. And you see these familiar words that that mark out the beginning of each of the sections of the book of Genesis. You can go through later and, and see the other ones. We've seen a number of them as they go along. This is the account of, is how they all begin, Genesis 11, 27. This is the account of Terah's family line. And even there, in the opening verse of our preaching text this morning, is something that that I think is fascinating. According to Genesis, what follows now, what follows from this point onwards, is the account of Terah's family line. I wouldn't have described it that way, would you? Would you have described it that way? What I would have said was, this is the account of Abram's family line. Because Abram is the single character that the camera lens is about to zoom in on and crops her everything else is almost out of the picture. Of all the family of the earth, of all the nations, of all the people, we're about to zoom in on Abram. We say, don't we, that we worship the God of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. Terah is not included. But this is the account of Terah's family line. This tragedy in Terah's family line. Not much is going well in this new family. That of all the multitude of families living on the earth, the, 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 the camera of scripture is zooming in on. Not much is going well at all. Terah's youngest son, Haran, dies. Terah buries his son. Lot buries his father. Abram and Nahor, the the remaining sons of Terah, marry. Nahor and his wife Milcah, they they exit stage left at this point. Their role in the story is is almost over before it begins. And that's two-thirds of Terah's family line gone almost two-thirds of it just just gone just like that 
In fact, it's almost ironic that I should call this first theme a new family because it looks like Abram's family also is over before it can begin. Because what do we see in the text? Sarai, verse 30, was childless because she was not able to conceive. But this is the account of Terah's family line, according to Scripture. An unlikely candidate for anything promising. One son has died, one son has gone from the picture, the remaining son and his wife have no children and can have no children, and there's an orphaned grandson. But this is a new family, a new focus, and through this unlikely family, God is going to bring new hope into his world, into his kingdom. But I think it's fitting that this is the account of Terah's family line for another reason. Because did you notice that it's Terah himself who sets out on foot for Canaan? He sets out on foot for Canaan with his small extended family. Now he doesn't get to Canaan, that's true. And we're not told that God called him to go, but but go he went. Maybe God called Abram and Terah came along with him. He, the father following the son that's unusual in the ancient world so Terah doesn't get to Canaan that's true he gets to a place called Haran almost but not quite the name of his son who had died what does he do he he quits his journey there when they came to Haran they settled there and Terah lived 205 years and he died in Haran And friends, the more I reflect on this introductory paragraph, the more I see hope. The more I see the hope that a story like this would have given to God's people. Reflect with me uh, for a moment on, on later Israel and some of the situations in which she hears these words afresh. Think of God's people and the exodus out of Egypt. That too was an unlikely beginning. A slave people seeking to escape from the most powerful empire on earth. And then on the verge of the promised land, on the verge of the land of Canaan, on the verge of the promised land, remembering the death of a whole generation who died in the wilderness before they got there, who doubted God's power to give them the promised land. And there's hope for God's people coming out of Egypt, about to cross into the promised land. There's hope for God's people, not because of their numbers, not because of their obedience, not because they're stronger or wiser or more powerful than than the Canaanites. There's hope for none of those reasons. There's hope because God is a God of unlikely beginnings. God takes no hope and turns no hope into an unlikely but incredible future. Trust him, people of God, as you enter into the land. Or think with me of God's people later in exile in the land of Babylon. Where are they? In Terah's birthplace. Ur of the Chaldeans, of the Chaldeans, of the land of Babylon. Do they have a promising future? Not really, not if you look by sight. Again, a captive people in exile with with no power, no influence, no hope, no earthly hope. But there is hope. There's hope not because of who they are. There's hope because of who God is and, and because of God's promises. Because of God's powerful control of history. Because of God's ability to turn the most unlikely circumstances into his plan to bring hope into the world. And what that means, friends, is that there's hope for us. There's even greater hope for us as we look back on on the most unlikely hope offered to us in the birth of a baby boy in a humble stable in a backward town. Outside of Jerusalem. 
Hope that comes again from an unlikely family. Family that's a bit of a social embarrassment. With a baby due less than nine months after marriage. And from that unlikely family comes the greatest hope the world has ever known. And so that gives us hope in our circumstances today. Because we're not Terah, we're not Abram, but we are Abram's children by faith. And if we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, his God is our God. A God who brings hope out of hopelessness. A God who accomplishes his purposes in the world in the midst of the most unlikely circumstances. And that means that even if we are living in a time of darkness where we can't see very far, where we can't see anywhere at all even, where we can't see the future, we can't see what God is doing, what God might do, we have reason for hope ourselves this morning. A new hope because we follow a faithful God. Friends, the hope that Abram and his family knew wasn't a hope that was undefined either. It was a hope that had shape, particular shape. Look with me at our second theme. It's a hope with foundations in a new promise or a series of promises. Let me read those words of promises to you. The Lord had said to Abram, as in by way of introduction, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. The words of promise that we'll we'll come to in a moment. The words of promise are accompanied by a choice in verse 1. God offers Abram a great series of incredible promises. But they come with a condition attached. Abram, do you trust me? Abram, are you willing to exchange the land that you can see for a land that you have never seen? Abram, are you willing to leave father and mother and follow me? Abram, are you willing to abandon even your family in the hope of an impossible family that I'm promising you? Abram. What is your answer? Abram, will you live by faith? Will you trust me? You see, Abram might be living in in a world far, far away, separated from us by, by time and geography and history and culture. But I ask this morning, is there really that much difference in principle between the call that God issues to Abram and the call of Jesus To leave everything, come follow me. Is there really that much difference between Abram walking by faith to an unknown land and the call of Jesus for us to to, to give up everything to gain a kingdom? Is there really much difference between the choice that Abram made to trust God And the profession of faith that Kenrick has made this morning to trust the same God. In principle, I think all of these are similar. A call to walk by faith. A call from the same unchanging God to people who can't see what's being promised with anything other than the eyes of faith. Give up what you have for what I promise. That's what God's saying. Sell everything that you have to gain the pearl of great price, that, that, is, that, that, that treasure hidden in the field. You know what, friends? Abram's, Abram's faith to leave everything to follow God is, is remarkable. The faith that any of us exercise to leave everything to follow God is remarkable. You see, faith, friends, isn't something weak. Faith isn't something that's wishy-washy. Faith isn't something for, for, for the weak of mind, for, in a manner of speaking, it is truly incredible to give up what you have for certain, 
To give up what you can see with your own eyes. To give up your comfort and your security and, and, and your, all the things that you have for a future that you can't see. For promises that haven't yet been realized. As, as Hebrews 11 said, they were longing for some, that, that they received the promises, but they didn't receive what was promised. They only saw those things from a distance. It is an incredible thing for any of us to give up what we have for what we don't yet have, for what God promises. Faith, you see, only makes sense when, when God himself has opened your heart to believe. Only then do you see that the trade, that the bargain, that the deal that God is offering you is a deal that's in your favor. Only then do you see the incredible value of what God is offering you in exchange for following him. Only then do you see God himself. Only then do you see God who is the object of faith. Only then do you desire God more than anything else that this world might offer you. Look at what God does offer Abram. He says, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. An impossible promise, friends. An impossible promise to a couple struggling with infertility. How can two people with no children become a great nation? Only by the power of God. And so as we see the rest of the Bible unfold, as, as scripture unfolds, we see the promise gradually begin to, to fill up. Isaac is miraculously born, given in sacrifice, and then offered and received back almost a second time. Jacob, 12 sons, 70 people going down into Egypt during the famine while Joseph is prime minister. A vast multitude return in the exodus. I will make you into a great nation. But the promise doesn't end there with the exodus either. The great nation finds its greatest fulfillment in Jesus, the seed that Abram has promised. And then Jesus sends out his disciples, he sends out his followers, he sends out us to disciple and turn the nations. To form one spiritual family, all following Jesus, Jew and Gentile, male and female, slave and free. All who walk in the faith of Abram, following Abram's God. We are the chosen people. We are the royal priesthood. We are the holy nation. We are God's special possession. That's who we are. We are the great nation that God promised Abram. And he has blessed us in the Lord Jesus. God says, And I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. Again, notice all the way through all of these promises, it's the work of God. I will make you, I will bless you, I will make you, you will be a blessing. All the work of God. God will make Abram famous. I want you to think back into chapter 11 that we were at last time. What do we see? We saw the builders of anti-kingdom at Babel. What did they seek to do? They sought to make a name for themselves, didn't they? Isn't that what they sought to do? We will make our name great, they said. And God scattered them and brought their self-promotion to nothing. Make your own name great and you'll fall on your face. But have God make your name great and you will be blessed indeed. God humbles the proud, Peter tells us, but gives grace to the humble. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse, God says. In other words, God will take your side. God will stand up for you. 
And those who honor Abram and for, and for the sake of his God and his kingdom, they will also receive God's blessing. Those who stand opposed to God and his kingdom will come to a sticky end. As Paul concludes in Romans 8, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Should trouble or hardship or persecution or nakedness or famine or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that nothing, absolutely nothing, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Lord blesses those who are in Christ. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And that, friends, is exactly what we have seen. That is the source of this new hope. That through Abram's descendants would come the descendant, the promised seed, the the one that we've been waiting for ever since we were back in Genesis 3 and, 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 and Adam and Eve fell into sin and God promised them one who would come to crush the serpent's head. The one who would put an end to all evil. The one whose coming would herald the kingdom of God breaking into this world. Jesus in whom there is a blessing for all who put their trust in him. But it's not enough to have just heard the name. Children, it's not enough to have been simply born into a Christian family. And yes, it's great that you've heard about Jesus. That's a great blessing to you. But you need to do something with that. You need to believe. You need to profess faith in the Lord Jesus as, as Kenrick has done this morning. You need to respond to the call of God. You need to commit yourself to following him, even as, as Abram committed himself to obedience and set off for the land of promise. God promises you the kingdom. And this kingdom will have no end. This kingdom shall have no bounds. In Jesus, there is blessing for all who call on his name. In Jesus, there is hope for all who put their trust in him. All peoples shall find blessing in Jesus. Is Jesus your new hope this morning? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that once again we can see how you bring hope out of hopelessness. You bring joy out of sorrow out of tragedy. You give hope where there is no hope. You give a future where there is only a bleak horizon otherwise. And we thank you for this. We thank you for your very great promises to Abram. Promises which are ours by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that we might know your blessing. We pray that our children might know your blessing through coming to put their faith in the Lord Jesus even as we have placed our trust and hope in him. Would you help us to follow him? Would you help us to follow him in the challenges that we face from both day to day and also more broadly from year to year and decade to decade in our lives? As each decade brings fresh challenges and a fresh call to to follow the Lord Jesus, to lay aside our own interests and desires and seek first the kingdom of God. Would you help us to do that as we, as we come up to the end of another year, as we reflect on a year that lies ahead, as we, as we in, in faith and seriously minded, we set our ambitions for the year to come, our resolutions, may they be resolutions anchored in the call of Christ to come and follow him. Help us to do this, Father. Forgive us for our many weaknesses and sins through faith in that same Lord Jesus in whose name we pray.
Amen. Let's conclude this morning with a psalm. We began with a psalm. We read a psalm. We sang a psalm. I'm going to conclude with a psalm as well from Psalm, psalm 67. And I've chosen this psalm because it speaks to us of some of these themes of Abram's promise. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The, the sense that, that, that may God, it begins, may God be gracious to us and bless us, make his face shine on us. Why? So that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Surely that's God's promises to Abram, is it not? I will bless you and make you a blessing. All the nations on earth will be blessed through you. And so we sing these same words, these words written a long time ago. We, we sing them with fresh understanding, with fresh hope this morning. How all the nations of the world will find blessing through Jesus. Let's stand to sing. as well. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.